Welcome to the Cracking Bags Podcast, where today's episode introduces an extraordinary guest, Matt Blanchard. Matt's journey is nothing short of remarkable, navigating through what many would consider an insurmountable challenge, not once, but twice. Every year, the world sees 250,000 to 500,000 new cases of spinal cord injuries, and Matt has faced this reality twice in his life. His story begins with a life-altering moment that could have ended in despair, but instead opened a path to unparalleled resilience and determination. His mantra, life happens for us, not to us. We must turn obstacles into opportunities, echoes through the actions and words. Today, Matt will share the pivotal and private moments of his journey, including the mental shifts that accompanied his physical transformation. We'll explore the profound realization that his decisions impacted more than just his life and uncover the challenges and decisions that played crucial roles in his survival and recovery. Reflecting on his experiences, Matt offers insights into the impact of spinal trauma, not just on the body, but on the soul and those who loved, who loved ones that surround him. As an anatomy teacher with a unique perspective on human body, he shares how his professional knowledge has influenced his personal recovery and resilience. Join us as we delve into a conversation about overcoming paralysis, finding motivation amidst adversity, and connecting with those who face their battles, guided by Matt's incredible story of turning obstacles into opportunities. And uh, this is going to be, buckle up, because this is going to be an incredible journey we're about ready to uh, partake on. We've got Matt Blanchard on our show, and I'm so stoked to have you on the show. Uh, I can't tell you, people, what you're about to hear is going to bring uh, spine-tingling hair standing for on Dr. Spencer's arms. is going to make you cry. It's going to make you laugh. So, Matt, welcome to the show, man. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. It's a good day. All right. So according to statistics, there are a quarter of a million to half a million spinal cord injuries in the world every year. So think about that, people. Half a million people have been struck down by a spinal cord injury. This man we're about to talk to has been struck down twice. And you know, when I tell people uh, coming on the show, we have a guy who's been paralyzed twice, their eyes just explode. And there's right now, it's a hot topic because on Netflix, there's a show called Full Circle. And they talk about two guys that have both been injured, spinal, um, paralyzed. And the narrator is coming from a guy named Barry Corbett, who is a very famous skier, first American to climb Everest. And he fell out of a hol- helicopter and got paralyzed. So he wrote this book back in 1980 that a lot of uh, hospitals use as their Bible when they're first talking to people. And in this, I'm going to quote, he said, anger and despair is acute. It's so powerful that it overwhelms reason and intention. It's strong stuff. It draws off so much energy that the mind and the body reach a point where they can't sustain the energy demand. You've gone through this energy sucking demand twice. I want to hear and I want you to set the, we're going to talk about your journey, but let's set the stage the moment your life changed. Yeah. So the, laying there in the ICU and not realizing what had happened yet, uh, reaching down, I hadn't set up in 10 days and all I wanted to do was sit up. And I, I reached down and I grabbed my quads to try and pull myself to a sitting position. And as I did that, I couldn't feel the touch of my hands. And that's when it sank in that, this is this really happened and man i didn't know what i was from that i i'm i'm six foot two 215 pounds um at the time i just run the saint george marathon in october literally was in the best shape of my life and didn't think anything could hurt me i i was that guy uh and when i reached down and could not feel my legs i i just started crying and um did not know what to do. Didn't know what to do. And uh, super scary. Everything's so scary. Uh, 
when when you have an acute injury or any type of uh, loss, everything's your first birthday, your first your first everything. Well, for me, <laughs> it was going to be my first time sitting up and and rolling over and learning how to put my socks on, uh, learning to go to the bathroom a different way. And all those first times are scary because you don't know the outcome. Um, so when I was laying there, I didn't want to live anymore. I if I figured if I didn't wasn't going to run marathons. If I wasn't going to coach soccer and things like that, <clears throat> I didn't, I didn't want to live. I, it's, and here's the, here's the, here's the banger right here. I didn't want my wife married to a cripple. Like in my mind, she'd married six foot two, two fifteen man. And, at least my idea of a man. Um, not realizing that she'd been praying for years that I would be humbled and that uh, when my accident happened, she carried a lot of grief or uh, guilt about my accident, thinking that somehow God had uh, answered her prayers because now I needed her for everything, to, to go to the bathroom, to get dressed, to, I mean, everything. And the anger to not be independent anymore and literally to be dependent on everybody for everything I was, I was angry and, and I did not want to live. I didn't want to live a life of paralysis. I didn't want to live uh, a life if I, if I couldn't do the things I always used to do. So I, I tried to figure out a way to end my life. Um, so I didn't want to be a burden. Um, it was rough. It was rough. My dad, my dad came to me and in my, in my darkest hour, um, <clears throat> well, we're on, we're on, here it goes. See, because this is a medical program, uh, um, I hadn't had a, a BM in in 10 days because of all the pain pit medication and everything. And I underwent two surgeries. Um, and finally, they transferred me out of my ICU room into my own hospital room. And this was late in the afternoon. And somehow I got caught in, in a, the shuffle and got missed. But they'd given me enemas and all the all the things to try and get me to um vacate and it finally did yay it was amazing and but there was so much that it, 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 it i could feel it running up my back as i laid there in that bed not able to do anything i didn't have my uh nurse call yet uh it coming up all the way up behind my neck and in my uh, on my ears and sitting there praying and trying my best to yell for a nurse or somebody but at that point my I was so weak and um, I laid there in that and prayed and prayed and prayed and felt abandoned by God, abandoned by my family and friends, my wife. And that right there, I, I broke. And I, and I don't know if anybody's ever, I mean, depression, I've gone through depression, but I, I broke mentally and I did not want to live any, like I did not want to live. And, um, the next morning the nurses, the nurse changed and they come and find me and these cute CNAs, super cute CNAs come in and to, to clean me all up and they're rolling me from one side to the next. And they're just rapping out about their weekend. And, and here I am 30 years old with every, that everywhere, gotten into my incisions, um, got infected. And as they rolled me so nonchalantly like they'd done it a million times because they had but that was my first time and those cute girls it only compounded the problem and so i i decided i was not going to speak to anybody or acknowledge anybody i and hopefully i would just somehow this nightmare would go away so it, as I, I grew up in salt lake and that's where i was lifelighted to and as people would come into my room, and I'm talking people from my elementary school all the way up to the University of Utah, people I've known my entire life, they'd come into my room to wish me well, give me love. I wouldn't open my eyes for anybody. I wouldn't acknowledge or engage in any conversation. I just, I laid there and pretended like I was just heavily medicated or, or sleeping. And at the end of the day, after visiting hours were over, everybody left my room except my dad. And I, I wouldn't open my eyes or talk to my dad either. I mean, this is my dad, my coach, my, this is my guy. 
And he um, pulled a chair over to the side of my bed. And he said, Matt, this is paralysis. This, this, is, uh, this is big. You can quit. You, we, we can all quit. But do you have it in you to dig in, dig deep, and get it done? And, and I didn't know. It was so vague when he said that. And when he said it, I was pissed. I, I remember laying there in that bed. I wouldn't open my eyes or talk to my dad either. And thinking, you, you do not know how rubbery and cold my legs are. And non-responsive. Like, I couldn't sit up in the ICU because I didn't know how to anymore. My, so two inches above my belly button, I suffered a T12 um, compression burst. And that, a piece of that bone went into my spinal cord. And I lost everything below the waist. And uh, my dad left. And so then I'm struggling with my dad's words all night. Dig in. And then instantly my mind would go, well, you're life in a wheelchair. And then dig deep. Like, well, <laughs> you're paralyzed. You know, that voice in your head is just so freaking powerful. And I, you know, get it, get it done. And I, I, I decided right then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk again. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to walk again. And I didn't, I had no um, knowledge of spinal cord injuries. I was Matt Blanchard, 10 feet tall and bulletproof, like whatever, spinal cord injury. I got this. Like I literally took that mindset of I'm going to walk again. And I focused all of my energy on this goal of walking. The, the, the problem was the, ne the following morning, my occupational therapist comes in the room and at, looks right at me, Matt, what do you want to do? And I'm, hey, uh, Casey, his name's Casey. I, I want to walk. And he's brilliant. He's heard, heard this millions of times. He's, okay, we'll walk. But first, I want you to get your socks on. And I laughed. I, I out loud laughed. And I'm like, you, if I get my socks on, we'll walk. And he says, you get your socks on, and we'll practice walking. I said, straight? So he starts to leave the room and throws me a pair of socks. I'm like, Casey, where are you going? He's like, get your socks on. I'll be right back. 40 minutes goes by. No socks. No socks. And I'm a sweaty, exhausted mess. I'm, when I get frustrated, I cuss. Okay. So I am, I'm a cussing machine and the harder it is. And the more I'm sweating, the more therapists and doctors are coming into the room. Hey, are you okay? Are you right? And I'm like, get my, get my socks on. I'm not going to leave me Get my socks on. And uh, Casey comes in because I was making so much racket. And he's like, hey, Matt, do you want some help? Do you want help getting your socks on? And I'm like, no, no, Casey, I, I don't, who needs help getting their socks on? And I, and I now know today that everyone needs help getting their socks on. My socks just look different than other people's socks. I've got this goal of walking. We all have goals of, of, of becoming something or doing something. Well, how do you get your socks on? But that's the first step. You know, I, I had to learn how to roll. And even before I got my socks on, I had to learn how to roll over, sit up. And, and then we started focusing on, on socks. And uh, it, so he leaves the room, throws me a lasso, like a hip out of a hip kit. You guys are probably familiar with that. And I'm trying to rope a foot that I can't see now. I've got a brace that goes from my, uh, a TLSO going from my uh, hips just under my clavicles. And I spend the next 20 minutes trying to rope a foot I can't see. Super frustrated now. So, so I've, there's an outline of sweat on my bed. I've used every cuss word in the book. I start making up some cuss words. And... Uh, <laughs> Finally, I rope my right foot after an hour and five minutes. And, and I'm so far gone in my mind. I start having a conversation with my right foot, right? I'm like, it has been an hour and five minutes. What is the deal? Blah, 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 blah. And I throw it down to the end of the bed the best I can. It kind of gets tangled up. And I say a little prayer and take a deep breath. God listens, even if you cuss. And uh, I, first time I rope my left foot pull that bad boy up to me. I start commending it on the good job. Right. And, uh, it's an hour and 10 minutes. Casey comes walking into my room. He's applauding me. He's, he's been watching the whole time. He's like, Matt, you got your socks on hour and 10 minutes. Let's go walk. And I, I just laid down. I just, <laughs> not today. That was everything I had, everything I had, just get my socks on. And <clears throat> you know, so many times we struggle with, with accepting help, especially as a man is that, Hey, I don't need help. You know, I'm the one that helps people. And how quick I could have, how much quicker I could have got to my goal of walking, or at least practicing walking, if I would just accept it, help getting my socks on so that I could, and, but I'd tell you what, it took me four months to get my socks on uh, and be able to get dressed and get my socks on by myself. 
all because of being stubborn. We talked about that a little bit before because I didn't need help. I was not the guy that needed help. Um, and, and I remember thinking in my, and just before the accident too, I'm okay. Just, this is just before I'm okay. I, I, I'm too big and I'm too strong to get hurt. Other people suffer spinal cord injuries. Not me. Other people get in car accidents. Not me. Hey, hey Matt, can I ask you what, cause I know you've been through this twice. I'm, I'm assuming this is the first time. What accident did you have the first time? And ah. tell me about the second thing. Yeah, the so the, fir- the first the first accident happened in 2006, uh, January 16th. Isn't it crazy how we remember dates of something traumatic in our lives? That because everything goes back to a life before. But uh, I was in my brand new truck. One of my employees was with me. I was an electrical contractor at the time. And it was raining in St. George. He jumped in the cab of the truck and pointed right at me. He says, Matt, put your seatbelt on. And he's a 19-year-old punk kid. And I don't like being told what to do. And so instantly, because he told me I had to do this thing, there, there's not, not a chance in hell. So we jump on the highway, start heading up the highway. Rain turns to snow. Second time, his name's Brett. Brett says, Matt, put your seatbelt on. And this time I gave him all the reasons. You know, I'm six foot two, 215. Just ran the marathon. I'm your boss. I'm 30. You're fit. You're 19. Don't tell me what to do. So further up the canyon, we went and they, we had whiteout conditions. I'm following a semi truck. Semi truck gets off at an exit, um, but not me. And for the third time that morning, Brett said, Matt, please put your seatbelt on. And for the third time, I said no. So not not a still small voice or a warm, funny feeling. Someone sitting right next to me telling me, hey, protect yourself. Pride and arrogance. That's why I'm in a wheelchair. And, and I'm physically paralyzed. But my question is, how are you paralyzed? What paralyzes you? For anybody that's listening, if you're able-bodied, awesome. But you're just as paralyzed as I am. And will you allow someone to help you get your socks on? Okay. And if you will, you can get out of that paralysis and move on to your goal. Um, I'm lucky. Be- I'm lucky to be in a wheelchair. And this is why I get everybody's a game because nobody's going to be mean to the dude in the wheelchair. I, so, I, I mean, I can't tell you the last time I got a door for myself, um, the cheese at the supermarket that my wife likes so much, I can't reach that. So everybody already knows when I come in, they're like, Hey, you need cheese today. And so it's in, everybody smiles at me. We make eye contact. It's just like this today. I, you guys aren't going to be rude to the dude in the wheelchair. Right. But my, so what everybody else's paralysis, nobody can see that. Everybody sees my paralysis and gets an A game. What would the world be like if everybody saw everybody's paralysis and everybody gave everybody's an A game? Because we're all going through something and I am lucky enough for the world to see what I'm going through. I mean, I get front row Joe parking everywhere I go, right? I don't wait in line at Disneyland, right? It's all worth it. So, uh, so I, my, I go through that to tell my truck's tracks. He tells me to put my seatbelt on for the third time. I say no. I lose control of the back end of my truck. I get completely sideways, go down into the median between north and southbound traffic. My wheels cut, catch that wet, fresh dirt, and my truck launches into the air. It doesn't roll. It launches into the air. And it comes down. It, it hit the driver's door, and then, boom, came up onto the, the passenger side. Um, rips my hands from the steering wheel, starts its second rotation, and now it's throwing me throughout the cab like a rag doll. Um, Brett's buckled in, and when the truck stopped, it was on the passenger door. Everything was black. I was, I was confused what just happened, and I realized the reason why I couldn't see anything, everything was black, is that my hips were now covering my face. I was in this extended cab truck, and I remember looking up over my head and grabbing my knees, pulling them back down the floorboards. Now I'm sitting on Brett's lap and I knew instantly, like, Brett, I'm paralyzed. And it took emergency crews two hours to drive down, cut us out of the truck, put me on a gurney, put me in a helicopter, airlift me to the hospital where I had CTs, MRIs, all the things. And what had happened is, is I burst T12 
and a piece, it grenaded in my back. And a piece of that bone went into my spinal cord just enough that I lost everything below the waist. Went through two surgeries. Uh, the first surgery, I was so big and muscular, I was, they were even ble doing blood transfusions, so I was still bleeding out. They couldn't control the bleeding. Um, so they closed me, they took all that bone out, um, went in for a second surgery. Now my back right now is held together with 12 titanium screws, two rods, a plate and a basket. And that blast basket became a new vertebrae. Took out a rib, crushed it up, put it in there and uh, screwed me all together and let it calcify. So that's that's what happened in the first accident. Um, now I knew, I knew I was walking out of LDS hospital until I didn't. And I gave everything to walking. And when I got home to St. George, this, this was up in Salt Lake that I had therapy. That's when I did tried to destroy my marriage. Like did the absolute best to destroy my marriage. Said every mean thing that that a uh, yeah that a husband could say. Um, and my wife, with tears coming down her face, said, I, "I didn't fall in love with your legs. I'm not going anywhere." And right there, she turned around with a black sharpie, and in the corner of our mirror, she wrote, uh, "What type of day will it be today? You decide." And um, it really was a decision that I was going to live, and that I was I was going to walk again, and that I would I would do my best to be the man and the husband that my wife deserved. Um, yeah. The, the, the moment she told me that, because, because I had, I was ruthless, like ruthless. And when her response was, I'm, I didn't fall in love with your legs. I'm not going anywhere. I, I felt a, a peace because, because before that, I already knew she was going to leave me. You know, I, now I'm not this man, this man. I didn't know what I was. I, 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 everything was gone below the waist. And that was my idea of a man. Um, and now all that's gone. I was terror. I, I knew she would leave me. I just knew it. And um, she's my high school sweetheart. Uh, we're coming up on our 30th year of marriage. And she is a straight badass, man. My wife is a badass. Like, I'm a badass. And she is she is stronger than I can even imagine. Um, so after that, I, I found therapists and doctors that thought, okay, maybe, maybe Matt will walk again with the right attitude and effort. And, um, those are two things that we have control of all the time. Whether you're, you're in a prison cell or the president of the United States, you have control of your attitude and your effort. And, um, only, you know, whether you're giving your family or your team or whatever, a hundred percent, you're, you're the only one that knows that. And there's no such thing as 110%. I'll tell you that right now. There, there are, there's a hundred percent. Um, and there are times where you thought your hundred percent was right here, but you can go past that. Well, then you didn't reach a hundred percent or with lifting weights. If you're, if your max is 135 pounds, well, and you continue to work, it's going to go up. So your hundred percent will continue to continue to increase and change. So everybody's hundred percent is different. Once you give a hundred percent one time, that was it. That's your 100% because now the next time your 100% is more than that. And so I took on that mentality of, um, yeah, I'm going to walk again. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. Um, I was told at LDS hospital, because all I would, all I would do is, is every morning, Casey, I want to walk. Let's get your socks on. So four months goes by. I can get my socks on. I can sit up finally. Uh, not very well. You know, it, it feels like when you're paralyzed, it feels like you're sitting on a top. And you can just topple over. Have you guys ever felt what it's like to be paralyzed? I'm going to allow you and all the listeners to experience paralysis for the first time. So if you'll take your hand and put your middle finger down, and what you're going to do is put pressure against that knuckle. So if you've got anything hard, a desk or whatever, I'll do it on, I'll do it on my hand. So I'm putting pressure, and I've got my elbow up. So putting pressure on that knuckle, and you lift your pinky off, too easy. And your thumb and your index finger. Putting pressure on the knuckle, try to pull your ring finger off of your. That's what it's like to be paralyzed. That is exactly the feeling of paralysis. Asking your body to do something and it feels just stuck. 
So for any able-bodied person, put your knuckle against and, and put pressure and try to pull your ring finger off that surface. Not going to happen. And I and if everybody would just wiggle their toes real quick. Oh, I have not wiggled my toes in 19 years. I miss that so much. But uh, yeah, so I, I, I'm, I got my socks on and everything. Casey comes into my room one morning with my physician. And the, my physician looks right at me and says, Mr. Blanchard, I understand you want to walk. And I look right at him and no, you got it wrong, man. I'm going to walk. And he said, you've suffered a very severe spinal cord injury. And I've treated thousands of spinal cord injuries just like yours throughout my career. It would be a waste of my staff's time and a waste of your energy to focus on walking. It's impossible. T12 complete spinal cord injuries do not walk. Become independent in your wheelchair. And he turned around and left the room. And that is exactly what I needed to hear. Like, it's impossible? Bet. Watch this. Watch this. And I went to work on this impossibility for 15 years. 15 years. Because some goals take time. Um, you know, I, I spent a total of uh, a little over five months at LDS Hospital. And for a month straight, now we're wa- focusing on walking, which the doctor's upset about because it's a waste of his t- staff's time and mine. Um, and and it, it came, there came a day. Boy, I don't talk about this. Um, that I had a conversation with with God and and just said, look, if, if this is what it is, then this is what it is. But if if there's a possibility that I can do this thing, I need a sign, man. I need something. And uh, I moved my right foot forward in therapy, uh, maybe an inch. And, and they bring it back because I had four therapists around me, you know, because I'm, I'm a big guy. So somebody's there's one on each foot. There's one behind me with a gate belt and there's one in front of me with a gate belt. And we're just and I finally moved my right foot forward. I, I didn't realize you have to hip hike and you have to take the weight off that damn foot or you can't move it. But you, you don't know what you don't know. So it, it moved and they moved it back and I do it again. And so we did it over and over again so that we know it was actually my movement. And that was my sign, man, that, that this is going to happen. This is really going to happen. Um, so released, released from there, didn't walk out of LDS hospital, knew I was going to walk out of there. Uh, it was a rough day. Came home and surrounded myself with doctors and therapists that thought maybe, maybe with the right attitude and effort, he can do this thing. And yeah, we went to work and we, we started out with, with nothing. Um, they would put me on the sled at a zero incline and they would bend my knees up and, uh, with the goniometer, you guys know what that is. And I would just try to control my legs on the way back down. And at first they just flop, flop, flop. And you know, we did my therapist. I can't say enough about my therapist, but thinking outside the box all in, like I was all in on walking and, and that's what it takes. Um, with, with careers, with goals, with, with whatever. And they're hard. And so many people quit They're Don't quit. Like if, if that's one thing I would tell everybody listening, fail, fail, look forward to failure. Um, I, I call it failing forward. So I'll, I'll think something's going to work and I'll move forward and I'll fail at that thing. And I'll tweak it just a little bit. I'll take one variable and tweak it and I'll go again and fail again. And then tweak it and and go again. And that with walking, that huh, that's what it was. And just don't ever quit. There's there's a, there's one thing for sure: your dreams, your goals, whatever you want to be in life. If you quit, that'll never happen. It will never happen. So just don't quit. Fail and keep going. Everybody, there's so many other people. 97 percent of the world that's going to quit. Don't quit. Other people will fall off and, and you will achieve your goals. Surround yourself with people that'll help you get your socks on and go to work, man. Go to work. You got to have that team. You got to have that, that team. You can't, you can't do it alone. Truly. Um, hey, Matt, Matt, I got a question. Talk for me. You. I know I've been quiet. I've been quiet. This most of this, this conversation because I'm holding back, Shoot. choking back the tears here, <laughs> but it is between being inspired to the point of tears and being, 
And uh, when you were back telling about your dad, it was was crushing me. Uh, I love the story. I have a question regarding, are are you, uh, did you teach anatomy? How did that help or or hinder your understanding of what happened? Oh, great question. So it helped. It helped me understand it because now with anatomy, with our cadavers, I can look at the spinal cord. I can go to T12 and look and how the top spinal cord runs and the nerve roots and, you know, all the peripheral nerves. And it, it, it helped a lot. It really did. So so how I became a nat- an anatomy teacher is after I got hurt, I decided I wanted to be a physiatrist. The same person that told me, Matt, you're never walking again. Because uh, I wanted to go into, that's what I am, right? Like, that's the guy I am. Yeah. And and yeah. so I did all my undergrad for pre-med, got accepted to med school. And my wife said, babe, you'll be 54 years old by the time you're done. And we'll be half a million dollars in debt. You're not going to med school. I said, all right, straight. So I, I applied to PA <laughs> school, got into PA school. My wife said, I don't want you moving to Gilbert, Arizona, to AT Steel in Arizona. Uh Let's stay here with the family. So that's how I kind of fell into anatomy. And here's the here's the thing. I had I had a goal of being a physician. And so for everybody listening, have your goals. And if it's an impossible goal, like walking or climbing Mount Everest, anybody who ever before it was summited, anybody who ever tried to climb Mount Everest died. And so, uh, Doctor Spencer, are you kidding? Me? What, what you, Mount Everest? Everybody's died, bro. It's impossible. And today, 6,300 and some odd people have done the impossible. So uh, I decided to start teaching and I wanted, and I, and I started volunteering at the hospital so I could go into other patients' rooms who had suffered deficits and say, hey, life's going to be different, but it's going to be okay. I still play tennis. I pickleball, surf. Uh, cliff jump. I do all the things. I just do them a little different, man. And uh, so when a physician comes into a brand new spinal cord injury, and you guys probably know this, and says, and you're walk, you just walked into the room, instantly, instantly, you're like, this guy, I don't care how knowledgeable, he doesn't know what I'm going through, and and you don't, right? That's fair. That's fair. And our physicians know that down here. So when we have an acute injury, they call me, and I and I go with them from admit to to a discharge and we go through all the therapies and we drive cars and we laugh and we cry and er- but but me rolling into a room and saying it's going to be okay knowing that all this patient wants to do is walk knowing all that and, and i can say okay great but first number one is skin care because if you get skin breakdown you are not going to be walking. You're going to start, you're going to get septic. You're going to have bones showing. It's going to be a bad situation. So number one, skincare. Number two, bowel and bladder. If you, well, you got to learn how to go to the bathroom and both ways, because it's different for everybody. Paralyzed people go to the bathroom different. And then third, now we'll focus on walking. But if you don't take care of these two first, they will kill you. Uh, bowel and bladder will kill you and skin breakdown will kill you. That, and I know that's what I'll die from. And so I have to take care, be hypersensitive about my skin and, and about taking care of my bowel and bladder. Um, so many things in my life have happened for me. I, I, I'm a big believer that, that, that life happens for you, not to you. Um, I'm not a victim. I'll never play that victim card. But, but that being said, when you're in the middle of the fight, like when you're in the, in the trench, you cannot see that this is happening for you. You and and this is delicate right here, but I'm 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 gonna say it. Cancer victims, it's happened for you. If you've lost a child, that's happened for you. If you're wh- whatever you, your divorce, that's happened for you. Your 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 kids being estranged, that's happened for you. Don't be a victim. Figure out, okay, what do I need to do? What's this challenge? What's this? What's, what do I need to learn so I can get my socks on to be with my family or friends or, or how, how can I serve others? It's not about Matt Blanchard. It's about serving other people. And so many people are stuck in the past that, oh, my, 
I'm my mom, for example, bitter at men and this, that, and the other because of the divorce from my dad. And she is stuck. And she will talk about my mom, her divorce. And that happened when I was 10. And she'll still talk about it today. She is stuck in the past. So she's wasting the present talking about the past. Whether I want to be talking about the future, I want to spend the, fu- the present talking about the future. If you're stuck in the past, that causes depression. If you're stuck in the future, that causes anxiety. Stay present. It's, it's, that's how I survived. And at the end of the day, at, at the end of every day, I look, still look myself in the mirror and say, did you give your all today in everything you did? And if the answer is yes, it does not matter what Dr. Spencer thought, Dr. Terry thought, anybody thought. If, if, if I know I gave my best, because I'm the only one that knows if I did, then that's okay. Everybody else, hey, they can have their opinions, but I know there was no more to give. And I had to push my body that hard for that many years because I couldn't look myself in the mirror if I didn't and say, you gave your best today on walking. Now, I've learned a lot and grown a lot from my accident. My family took a back seat. I lost my company. Um, I became dependent on pain medication. Um, I'm not a big fan of labels. I wear I only wear labels that I want to wear. Uh, I'm not an addict. I'm not a recovering addict. I went through addiction. I'm not depressed. I mean, why would you want to label yourself that? I went through depression. So it's it's it's. That if you say that it's temporary, we can get the life is cyclical, and and if you're on top right now, kicking ass, right on, good job, get ready because it's coming, and if you're on the bottom getting your ass kicked right now, awesome, awesome. How can you say that, Matt? Because on the days that I and here's my number one when I have an accident as a 48 year old man, and I've got to go home and and get help to clean up this accident. That's my lowest. And I am grateful for those days because I know it's not going to get a whole lot harder than this. And with that total brokenness, without experiencing that, you cannot appreciate the triumph. So there's literally no value in winning. The value is in in the grind, in getting your ass kicked, so that when you do win, you can appreciate that win. But if you're just win, all I do is win, 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 well, then you don't appreciate that win, man, or you're not challenging yourself hard enough or whatever. It's important to fail over and over and over again. The, 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 but the most important thing is to not ever quit. So, so that's what I did. I took that mentality and I went to China, I had 70 million stem cells, put into my back, um, had acupuncture, had all, all the things, because there was a checklist, right, that I had to do to know, it, for me to sleep at night, I had to know I did everything I could to walk again, and I did everything. I lost my company, because I was traveling the world, the world, doing therapies, um, and then the nation, then I came home and traveled the nation doing therapies, uh, all in on walking all in on walking, uh, became dependent on pain medication. That was horrible. Absolutely freaking horrible. Uh, I, I, I was that squeaky clean kid from uh, Salt Lake city, Utah, uh, sent me home with a drug called Oxycontin. And I didn't know what this drug did other than when I took it, I could go hard in therapies and push this broken body hard. And then after five years, I was taking 390 milligrams a day. So, yeah. Wow. Yeah, I was on, um, I'd done every, every drug under the sun, um, 480 pills every two weeks, so almost 1,000 pills a month. But, but that was built up over the five years, and I was 100% dependent on pain medication. And, and then without walking the way I wanted to walk, so I was walking with forearm crutches, doing great. Um, put my wheelchair away. I had a walker and a, and a wheelchair, uh, I'm sorry, and forearm crutches. And I drove up to Salt Lake City with my forearm crutches, took the elevator to the fifth floor, went into that physician's office, stood in the doorway. This was five years later. And I said, hey, uh, doctor, do you remember me? And oh, he did, because I was a shitbird, man. And he's like, Mr. Blanchard. I was like, yes, that's right. 
He's like, what can I help you with? I said, you told me I would never do this. He's like, well, what's that? I said, you told me I'd never walk. And I'm standing there with my forearm crutches. His, his response was, you're not walking. You're using assisted devices. And he got up from behind his desk and walked past me. And so I walked back down to my car and I cried like a little baby. And I went home and I worked harder. I worked hard and I thought of this doctor in every therapy telling me that I couldn't walk. I wasn't going to walk. This was impossible. But now I know because I've matured that this guy's a stud. Like we have a great relationship. He's a stud. I love him. I needed that to push me because he knew, okay, this guy needs to hear that, that shit can't happen, that this has never happened before and it's not going to happen. And that's what I needed to hear. He's brilliant. He's brilliant. He's not the way, way with other patients as he was with me. And I love him. I love him today. Um, yeah. So, I, I mean, I could, I could still resent him or be angry at him, which drove me. He was in every therapy with me, every therapy. And he lived in Salt Lake City, Utah. I'm down here in St. George. And that guy is right there. You can't do this. You can't do this. And I would force my foot forward without him telling me I, I love him. So what challenges and like with your kids, what coach has told your kid that he's not good enough or he can't get the playing time or whatever. Good. Go work harder. Go work harder. It's not anybody's fault. It's all in your control. How bad do you want it? If you want it bad enough, then you'll go to work. If you don't, you'll sit and complain, pull your kid off the team or whatever else. Go to work, man. Life's hard. What are you teaching your kid? What are you teaching your kid if your coach just lit, his coach just lit him up or her up, and now you're pissed because he spoke the truth, and and now you have an option of either calling the guy a dirtbag or pulling your kid off the team or whatever, instead of saying, you know what, sweetheart, let's go to work. Let's prove this guy wrong. You're going to let him win? Really? Like, that's who I am. Life is a competition. Everybody wants the money. Everybody wants the house. Everybody wants the relationship. Everybody wants the thing. Everybody wants that. The people who want it the most get it. And those people fail countless times. They just don't ever quit. Matt, let me ask you about, um, I want to ask you about the second injury, but I want to compliment you on an extraordinary ability to motivate to take something so unfortunate that most people think and realize, you know, how it can move you and drive you. You know, I, I use the metaphor of a magnet, you know, has a positive and a negative side. If you cut the magnet in half and try to grasp onto the positive side, it doesn't work because it still ends up being a positive and a negative. So life is that. And you have created an environment where you really focus on what could be positive in the midst of negativity right so thank you well, for that. that you're doing a really fantastic <laughs> job of, of of motivating and i also think that doctors should really learn how to be more inspiring yes because most are are not they become very you know they, they lose all their their uh, connection and their, ta their tact and their bedside manner like yeah uh it's terrible yeah but, but you found a way for it to work for yes. you. So I commend you. I, I, now, now I, yeah, I got to hear about the, about the second thing. You know, <laughs> you got me built to this ledge that you, you're going to fucking walk. And uh, I, 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 come on, you got to hit me with this. Oh, dude, on. here we go. You ready? Buckle in. Here we go. I buckled, man. All right. <laughs> so uh, 15 years has gone by. I've been clean off of meds for eight years at, at the time. And I'm to the point where I can walk 40 yards with one single point cane in my left hand. Kid you not. You guys, I'm doing it. I'm doing it. And um, my little girl, she was, let's see, she was 10, 8. She was 8 when I got hurt. And I knew one day my little girl's going to get married. And dads walk their little girls down the aisle and do the daddy-daughter dance. And that was another driving force. So, 
January, or let's say September 25th of 2021, my little girl got married. And we had practiced walking down the aisle so many times with forearm crutches. We were dialed in with forearm crutches I, with single point canes. I could do it with single point canes. Um, sometimes I'd trip her up, you know, I'd get on her dress or whatever. And, and she wanted me to use forearm crutches. Cause for some reason, she wanted the day to be about her. I mean, I don't get it, right? What's so, up with that? The wedding day about her? Come on, sweetheart. <laughs> So we've got these forearm crutches and we practice walking down the aisle. And then the daddy daughter dance, I used one single point cane and I could twirl her. And it was amazing, man. Amazing. Uh, seven months before that, February 12th of 2021, I'm going down to Nevada to Las Vegas. I'm heading southbound and a, an impaired driver heading northbound drunk driver in a Chrysler 300. Uh, went through the median and hit me head on, went through some bushes. It was dark at night. Um, if you want, you can go on my socials and see this thing happen. I've got a dash cam, but she goes through, uh, some bushes, a cactus takes out her front headlights and cracks me head on a 120 mile an hour impact. Yeah. So I was in the slow lane doing 80, just on my cruise control. She came across right around 40, 50 miles an hour head on. Um, I was wearing my seatbelt this time, but I suffered an L4 burst and I was paralyzed for a second time. Uh, I'm, I'm in my truck. I was trapped down by the brake and the, the gas pedal. I had a compound fractured my tib fib on the left. Um, and it was just my, my left foot was just upside down and backwards. My right femur had been broken. My uh, hip, my acetabulum, my femoral head, everything. I was busted up. And I, this is how annoyingly positive I am in my, but it took time to get there. So I remember looking down at my body and my right leg is way the heck over here. And it's in, you can see a couple things. My left foot's upside down and backwards. And I looked at my body and I said, I am so happy I'm paralyzed because I can't feel this. It, so it was, that's how annoyingly positive I am. And, and, uh, so there, there was an EMT, my truck had started on fire. So she came and put the fire out. She had a fire extinguisher of all things in her car, uh, put the fire out and went over to the other car. She wasn't wearing her seatbelt and, and the steering wheel had been pushed and pinched her right in half. So she was alive, but as soon as they cut her from the vehicle, she bled out. And I, I sat and watched this. I was in that truck for a little over two hours. So for a second time, emergency crews had to cut me from my truck with the jaws alive. For a second time, I was airlifted. And for a second time, I was paralyzed. So those 15 years of walk of practicing walking, walking my little girl down the aisle, gone. Just like that. But I, I know that life happens for me, not to me. I know this. And so as I'm in the hospital, learning how to roll over, sit up, get my socks on, shower, all the things uh, for a second time, it wasn't as scary because I already knew I, I can do this. I've done it once. So I'll do it again. And, I, and the team, my team around me, they, they knew. They knew. And when I lost sight of my goal at times, my team says, what are you doing? What are you doing? It, it, it's very true. I think it's is Wayne Dyer, maybe, that said, you're the average of the five people you hang around the most. And it's, it's a fact. That's not a cliche. That's a fact. And I know that most people want to be wealthy. And they're broke. Well, you're hanging around broke people, man. That's just, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm just telling you straight. That's, that's why I, I'm a blunt object. So if you want to become a millionaire, start hanging around millionaires. I, I'm lecturing to a uh, group of billionaires one day. And one of the billionaires right in the middle of my presentation says, Matt, whoa, hold on, hold on. Why are you not a billionaire? Why are you only a millionaire, Matt? And I was like, well, hold on. I, I don't have enough income or this or that or the other. And he's like, no, I'll tell you why you're not a billionaire. You think like a millionaire. And I just sat there. I'm like, okay, well, then how does a billionaire think? And he said this, you go out and make 10 people or help out 10 people become millionaires by default, you'll become a billionaire. Billionaires help other people become millionaires. Matt, this life is not about you. It's about us. Change 
my entire perspective. I'd never thought of being a billionaire before, ever. You know, but now, all right. The, the, this whole room of, of gentlemen, and I spent a, I spent a whole uh, weekend with them. You know, and, and boy, facts. It's it. Everybody listening, this life is not about you. It's not. It's about us. It's it's about us. And if you, we can get out of our ways and go and serve other people, how do we serve other people? I'm gonna let everybody know right now how we change the world. Eye contact and a smile will change the world. And those two things cost you nothing. Surround yourself with people who give you the best opportunity to reach your goals and go to work. So if you're in a group of people that are talking about where they want to go and all the big things they're going to do, and that's all you've done for the last five years, guess what? You're not going anywhere, man. You're just not. People, I, I, I think you need to have the guts, the tenacity, the fortitude, um, the resiliency, and the relentless pursuit of your dream, of your goal, because average sucks. <laughs> average sucks. Hey, hey, hey man, I'm, I'm gonna. Inter- 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 I, I, I gotta interject a second. My partner loves uh, using analogies, and I have this analogy right now. So right now, you, for the listeners listening to this, until you see the YouTube video, a car accident took you took your ability to walk basically twice, right? Yep. You're recording from a car. I am. How freaking cool is that when you think about that, that here you're talking about being positive and the average person in life would never set foot in a car again. And you're right. recording from a car telling us positive messages when the car accident twice took your took you. Right. And, and I just had to point that out. I'm sitting there listening to you. I'm like, the guy's sitting in the car right now talking to us and the car accident took him and yeah. you flipped it around to go and no, this is my place of positive. This is my place of giving and all that. So sorry for interjecting, but I just, I just saw this, this little thing. I go, that's freaking cool. Actually. It's it's no, no, it's true. Uh, it, I was terrified to drive again, terrified. And that's why I drive because yeah. I, because I was so scared of it. <laughs> Um, so, so in therapies, when I first got hurt, the therapist would ask me, what do you want to do today? Cause now I knew I would take what I was most fearful of. And that's what we would work on. I would share my biggest fear with the doctors, the therapists, family and friends. And that's what we focused on. So I, I, I attack life. Like I'm paralyzed, but I live big. I live hard and I love my life. I love my life paralysis has allowed me to become the man i was always supposed to be yeah the 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 biggest challenge in my life one that everyone prayed for when it first happened to be taken from me what a travesty if that would if if god would have done that because i would have gone back to being an electrician and wiring buildings and being this self-centered uh egotistical son of a bitch that that it's my way or the highway. I don't need help from anybody. Oh, you don't like my way? Then get on the other team. Get on my team or get out of my way. That's who I was before. Now I realize the more people I ask for help, the quicker I am going to get to my goal. As long as they're right, the right people. So what's your goal? Find your people. Go to work. So Easy as I, got, I got to ask you something, you know, for those of you that are going to want to lick you up and and uh, they're going to be intrigued by you, which is what I did. And, you know, I kind of talked to you a little bit about this. When I went through your, your Instagram page and I went all the way to the bottom for your very first post, uh-huh. you your kids, right? Yeah. <laughs> and then you had a couple of your kids. And then I started working a timeline back up to present day. And we talked about this a little bit. And I went – Holy crap, you can see the transformation in just your photographs. And you can see the transformation of the importance and all that. And your first picture was your two kids when they were young. The last picture you have is you're on stage looking like a freaking warrior. And so I want to know if you can kind of walk a little bit through the transformation in your photos and how it compared to your life. All right, you're going to make me cry here, um, but that's okay. Vulnerability is my superpower. It is, and uh, a lot of men 
are afraid of that vulnerability. And that's what your wives want, guys. And that's what your, your your girlfriend wants. So um, so we, we were cooking dinner one night and I went down the hall. This was, uh, my kids were younger. They were, they were, well, they were all in their teens. They were all at home still. And as I rolled down the hall to get them to come to dinner, I, I overheard all three of them talking. And um, they were talking about me and uh, how I was their hero and that uh, their, uh, there wasn't anything that I couldn't do. And because of that, there was nothing that they couldn't do and accomplish. And at that moment, it was all worth it. Um, to not to not ask your kids or have anybody ask, but have these young kids, these teenagers, saying that their dad's their hero. Um, man, it, that that was okay. It was um, that was the day. That was the day that. It's okay if you don't ever play basketball again, Matt. It's okay if you don't run marathons again. It's okay. Um, that life's different. You don't need to be. You don't need to be the guy you used to be. In fact, nobody even wants you to be that guy. My wife, my kids, nobody wanted me to be that guy anymore. We they they did a, a short documentary on my family right after I got hurt. My kids were still super young, and um, they said, "No, I prefer my dad from a wheelchair." And they asked why. Well, my dad is to all my soccer games now. My dad hasn't missed one soccer game. My dad hasn't missed one piano recital. My dad hasn't, because I I used to think that money, money was what a man brings in and he does the cars and he does the house and he does the, uh, and mama raises and, and does laundry. And, the, and I would fly into vacations and fly back out. I would, because, because that's what I thought. And, and paralysis is the best thing that's ever happened to me, man. Uh, I hate it with every fiber of my being, and I wouldn't change it for one second. Uh, the the it allowed, like I said, it allowed me to become the person that I've always meant to be. I, I'm on stages. I've influenced hundreds of thousands of people with my story. Um, you know, it's if I were an electrician still, I'd be wiring buildings and chasing money, missing out on my kids' lives. My kids want to hang. My kids want to hang out with me, like our family. That that's our tribe. Like we do everything together. We party together. We do everything together. Because and my I'll come home and my kids and their friends will be at the house, and we'll you know food. The kids love food, so if you have food, you're you're in good shape. But uh, they choose to be there. You know, I don't have to ask. Um, that's my success. That's success to me. Not having millions of dollars in a bank account or my family, my kids wanting, choosing me, choosing me, my wife choosing me. I could be dead broke, bankrupt, and I'm successful. I, I've done some good things. So yeah, the, the transformation going from a very selfish, very narcissistic, egotistical, chauvinist, Good guy, really good guy, but a little bit of me went a long way. You know what I mean? And to now, you can you can feel it. You guys can feel it. If you're listening, you, I, people are drawn to me because I'm vulnerable. I'm real. I'm authentic. I've gone through hard things, but guess what? You're going through hard things too. My, my hard thing is everybody can see it, and so many people suffer in silence. God, energy, whatever you want to call it, whatever you want to believe in, in that second accident made it very clear, very clear that my purpose is to inspire and motivate. And Matt, you are not reaching your full potential. And and so after that second accident, I went all in. I went all in. And um, things have, boy, it's just fuel to the fire. It's It's been, it's been amazing. Like, like opportunities like this. If I was paralyzed, I would never have met you guys. I'd have never been on this podcast. And your listeners would have, ne- you know what I mean? It's your, your challenges, your trials, even as hell, hellacious as they are, you can be either a victim, it's a choice, or you can be a victor. 
and I and I just choose to be a victor every time. And I, this John Wooden, he's never lost a game, and neither have I. I've just I've just been behind when time ran out. That's what's <laughs> that's my attitude, right? Like I'm gonna get you. I will get you. Okay, time's out. I'll get you next time. Like that's just that. that's my mentality, you know. Um, challenges, like I look forward to my challenges, hard things. I look forward to them. I really do because I know they serve me. I know it's happening for me. And if I want to get through that challenge, like I'm sure May said the same thing about the buffalo, right? Turn turn into the storm. If you're in the <laughs> storm, turn into it. Lean into it. Don't run from it. You'll be in the storm for a long time. So dig in, dig deep, and get it done. Oh. So, Matt, with that said, and the fact that you love a good challenge, I would be remiss if we didn't take a, a last moment in our conversation today to go and do our classic rapid-fire questions. Ooh. These are random questions I'm going to throw at you, and it, it challenges you to be very impromptu and give a short answer, which we end up diving into more. <laughs> right, later. right, right. <laughs> the answer you give. But if you're ready. Hold on. Let me sit down. I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting for you to say it. Oh, let me stand man. up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. That was good. Well, if you're ready for question number one, you better buckle Let's up. Go. I love it. Let's do it. Let's do it. I love there it. You go. I love it. All right, man. Question number one, man. Oh, my gosh. If you could have one superpower, what would it be and why? One superpower. Mm. To love unconditionally. Oh. Yeah, because love's the answer. Fantastic. Love's the answer to everything. Right. God, you guys are going to make me cry again. Like, I'm, I'm passionate about <laughs> that. Great. Well, Matt, join the club. I've been trying to do this whole fucking hour already. All right. God. Yeah. Love is always the answer, man. Love wins out. It always wins out. I agree. I agree. Question number two. What are three things that you have yet to accomplish that are possibly on your bucket list? Okay. I uh, will go to Australia. I've always wanted to go to Australia. My dad's always wanted to go to Australia. My dad's passed, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to Australia. That's one thing. Uh, grandpa. Oh, my gosh. I'll be a grandpa in May. Uh, my little girl. Yep. My little girl and her husband are having our first grandchild. So I am stoked about being a grandpa. Yeah. And uh, third, here it is. I'm going to speak at Madison Square Garden. Yep. No you bet. How? Nice. So, so how? I, I don't know. But there may be a listener. There may be. That's how that's how yeah. goals work. I'm I'm at, I'm getting my socks on with you guys with with anybody listening. I will speak at Madison Square Garden. You bet. How? I don't know, that's but that's great. the fun part. That's the fun part figuring out how. Well, All right. based on based on understanding your behavior, I dare you. Nada, babe, and you'll be there. Yeah. And you'll be there. In fact, I might have you guys introduce me. I want to have you guys have your, yeah, have you introduce me. You about it? Let's do it. Uh, I am all about that. Wait, I'm, I'm going to add something on uh, uh, that. There's no way in hell you'll be able to do that. Ah, I love it. That's what I needed to hear. That's what I needed to hear. There it goes. Right there, Terry. There it is. I love I got, it. I, got, I, want, I want, what's one thing on your bucket list physically, not yes. emotionally or anything like that, that you, that you want to do? Physically. I want to, uh, well, not want, I'm going, I, I don't like that word. So anyway, I'm going to do a marathon from a chair and I'm going to qualify for the Boston marathon from a chair. Nah. So there it is physically. There All right. Is. So, and, and the guy that will run it with you is Spencer. Cause he's a big runner. So <laughs> I used to be as well, dude, you know what? I, I love the pain. I loved the pain of, of, uh, training for that marathon getting stronger yeah um yeah i i love it if you if you right. you know if they're sorry because I, I talk all dog on day yeah uh if you uh, love no. instead of looking for the destination so many of us get uh focused on the definite destination and then you finally get to the destination and it wasn't what it, you thought it was going to be you got to enjoy the journey 
the destination. 100%. You got to enjoy the journey, man. 100%. Yeah, All right. Well, let's see. Madison, Question number three. Madison Square Guards, Boston Marathon. You know, what you do is you run Boston Marathon, and since you're right back east, you just go to uh, Madison Square Gardens to speak. Let's do it. Let's do it. It's done. It, it, you know what's already done? Here's another thing. My future self, and think of your future selves, have already taken care of it. So everybody listening, you've gone through all hard times. Everybody's gone through hard times. And you are still here because your, your, your self of today has taken care of all the bullshit you were worried about in the past. Well, guess what? All your worries today, your future self has already taken care of it. You've never letting yourself down. So why are you going to start now? So chill out, man. Chill out. You've already taken care of it. If you trust yourself, you've already taken care of it. Oh, that's beautiful. Question number three, Matt. What is one thing that you wish every caregiver of spinal cord injuries would learn? Mm. That, it's, that it's your patient's first time. That, that, <laughs> that, that it's their first everything. And even though you've done it a million times, it's to, to board transfer is scary. To sit up is scary. To to self cath, oh my gosh, that's scary. To digistem, and I know some of your listeners don't know what I'm talking about right now. I know you guys do. That's scary. So be gentle, be patient, be empathetic, but at the same time, be this. This needs to happen for your health, and so that's what I would want is for them to just. I know you've been a physician for 20 years, but th the patient you're going to go in and see, they just got hurt. So this is their first time. So what you're going to say, you're God at that point. You really are. You're God. So tread lightly. Tread lightly. Yeah. Super good. Question number four of five is what tip do you give someone who is fresh to an injury ah, of this nature? Love it. Don't compete with who you were. You'll never be that person ever again. The, the, so the person I was, that's all I wanted to be. I just want to be that guy again. Well, I had already experienced more than that guy ever could even handle. So I, he can't do what I do. He hasn't experienced the emotional or whatever. So do not compete with you of yesterday. Be a better version of yourself today than you were yesterday that that's what i do so that, that any patient i know you want to walk i know you want to be who you used to be that person's gone you will never be that person ever again you've already experienced too much so let's do the best we can today and let's measure wins from zero from today not from how you used to run marathons and stand up and all this stuff because if i if I'd have done that i would fail over and over i wouldn't i still not physically where that guy used to be and i never will be so i need to just be a better version of myself today than yesterday Whew. the last question matt so far <laughs> you've knocked our socks off Oh, wait. Put it back on. Put it back on. Okay. Oh, that's good. That's good. Yeah. I love it. Question number five is an interesting one because it has to do with mental health. And reading in the uh, New York Times yesterday, it, there was a big article on, on suicide. And I know that that played out in your head at one yes. or two or 10,000 points of times in your life. But mental health as far as any tips that you could give to someone when they're going through something bad is there any suggestions you have your absence would leave such a hole in in this existence and would be so far reaching that you have no idea that'd be that would be first second is this is temporary as dark as it might be as as hopeless as it might seem it's temporary. I, I promise you'll, you'll get through it. You'll, you'll get through it. Don't quit. Don't ever quit. Um, I, you know, and, and I, it's probably hard for people to hear that as for me, the number one thing in my life would be a loss of a child. And so when I, when I say that, that that's where my mind goes, what if, what if somebody's listening to this and they've just lost a child, something that 
changes you, just like paralysis. It's happening for you. This existence is literally a blink of an eye. What, what, what we've gone through, what we're experiencing right now is literally a blink of an eye. We will all be together again. I, I was lucky enough to experience what's next, and it's it's unbelievable. It's There are not words, because I'm bound by this English language, um, but don't quit. This existence is hard. It was designed that way. Uh, we learn the most through our pain and suffering and challenges. So don't quit. Just just don't quit. And, and, and this was me. I can't speak. This was me. I would make it through the minute. I would have suicidal thoughts and whatever. Okay, we'll, we'll do this, but 60 seconds. In 60 seconds, we'll do this. And then it got from 60 to 10 to, to an hour to, okay, we'll do this tomorrow. So just get through the minute. If you're so dark right now and so lost right now, then just get through the minute and then to the next minute. But don't focus on minute two. Just focus on minute one and then and continue. So, so yes, you can, you can do it tomorrow. Uh, it, you know, just to parlay something extremely important about mental health and suicide that Part of the article was very, very revealing, and it discussed that contemplating suicide is what they found is a, is a, they, there's been an increase in suicide by like 56% around the world, but in the United States, it's actually decreasing. Mm-hmm. And it had to do with an article of about the uh, San Francisco Bridge, which is the most popular, one of the most popular places in the world that people jump, I mean, in the country for people to jump. So they 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 uh, engineered twenty feet of netting to go either side, because they know, and what they realized, and the reason why suicides are actually decreasing in the United States is because suicide is such a uh, uh, a sudden you know decision to make right. that is irrationally based, and usually people that don't die from the the, a suicidal um, uh, uh, attempt, they are, for, you know, happy to be living, and so we realize if we remove all of the the um, possible ways of doing something sudden, yeah. then people are going to survive their their suicidal ideations. So. Thank you for bringing that up, man, because that's that's a big yeah. Thing. Thank you for that. Yeah, that that information. Yeah, um, if we can take away the things, you know, and make it through the moment, because it, it's it is in the moment. It seems so dark. It, it, this it, it will pass. It it will pass. I promise you, it will pass. All right, Matt. We're gonna we're gonna close this down. But so you have the floor, and. A lot of good motivational speakers realize that um, it's the last thing you say is what people remember, right? Yeah. And it's that last five-minute statement or that last paragraph that lingers. So with that being said, you had the floor in a paragraph or less. What's the one thing you want people to remember about this talk? That your challenges – yeah, okay. Your challenges are happening for you, not to you. You're not a victim. The life's hard. It's supposed to be hard. We learn the most from our challenges that there's no, there's no value in winning. The value is in the grind. Um, love what you do. If you don't love what you do, find what you want to do and go do it. This life is too short to not do what you love. And then very simple, dig in, dig deep and get it done. I'm good. Yo, poor Spencer's going to take an hour to recover from this yeah, one. But I, I got to get a little Visine, a couple <laughs> tissues, you know. Because, man, that was powerful. Thank you for listening to today's episode of the Kraken Backs podcast. We hope you enjoyed it. Make sure you follow us on Instagram at Kraken Backs Podcast. Catch new episodes every Monday. See you next time.